Let's see. Okay. All right. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. All right. Well, it's my great honor to introduce our first online colloquium. And as Rick said, it is very fitting that he should be doing this um, as the pioneer of our technology efforts at Wake Forest. Um, now, I, I didn't, I'm not very good at introducing people, but I'll do my best. Uh, it is my understanding that Rick um, got his PhD and very from uh, UNC at Chapel Hill and very soon after joined the faculty at Wake Forest, I think in 1979, if that's something around there. That's it seems right. like only yesterday, really. <laughs> <laughs> but um, he, he has worked in so many different aspects of physics. He's a condensed matter um, experimentalist uh, in the beginning, and he's also enjoyed a lot of computational. I enjoyed working with him on some of that. And um, he uh, has now ventured into physics education. And, uh, you know, for as long as I've known him, he's been a pioneer in all of the latest technology. When when I joined the faculty, he was showing us all how to use Commodore 64s. <laughs> I don't know how many of you can imagine that, but <laughs> we've come a long way. And uh, I have very fond memories of our, our caravan to March meetings in which mm. we had one of these early kinds of cell phones, which I couldn't believe anyone would want to use, but he showed us how to do it, and it was much more fun that way. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so Rick has been, of course, a professor of physics. He's been department chair of our department. He's been a pro associate provost, and he has spent some time being chief information officer uh, uh, at, at IS. And now he is continuing to be a professor of physics, but also director of academic and instructional technology. And he's going to explain all that to us in his uh, first online colloquium of this semester. Well, thank you, Natalie. Thank, thank you all. And uh, I did mute you all just to hold down the background noise. But please feel free to unmute yourself at any time uh, to ask questions, uh, shout corrections. <laughs> or um, what, whatever contributions you'd like to make. Um, if, if you slide your mouse um, over the Zoom window, in the bottom left, you can see the mute button. And so you can use that to uh, unmute yourself. Um, and so, um, so I, I do welcome your questions at any time. So let me fire up the PowerPoint here. And, uh, I think this is the window I want. Let's Give this a try. All right, now, um, can uh, Natalie, could you tell me, are you seeing uh, the, the full screen thing rather than just looking like the uh, presenter view? Yes. All right, very You're good. good. All right, that sounds good. All right, so in the beginning, 1957, um, the first satellite was launched by the Soviet Union. I was eight years old. When I was 11 years old, uh, this the, uh, Echo One went up with uh, a lot of work from both NASA and the Naval Research Lab, which plays a role late, later in this story. I remember going out onto my front lawn in Mount Crog in South Carolina, looking up and seeing Echo pass overhead. And uh, it's hard to imagine the impact that the early space program had. Uh, Sputnik was terrifying. The idea that that uh, another country could send an uh, a satellite over us and we couldn't do a thing about it was wild, uh, scary, but also for some of us of a certain bent, exciting. And to see a satellite go over, that was wild. Um, I was 12 years old when the first uh, person went into space, uh, Alan Shepard, 1961. Also 1961, um, well, well, you can imagine, it, and how could you not want to be 
a scientist or an engineer or an astronaut or something like that at, at the dawn of the space age. And uh, my father took me once a week to a town about 19 miles away to get my ham radio license, take classes with the local amateur radio club. And I got my ham radio license. And so my interest in electronics and technology was off to a good start. Now, Mount Crogan is a, is a town of 145. Now, these numbers, this is, this is a town. You can see Mount Crogan Elementary School labeled in the upper left of the picture. Uh, the numbers are the, uh, labeling the houses of the teacher who taught me in that grade. So in the lower left, that's my first grade teacher. Uh, what's the significance? Well, this, this is how they're related to me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did have my mother in second grade, and my grandmother for the fifth and sixth grade. Uh, so I was genetically predisposed to go into education. <laughs> Let's look, jump forward a decade or more. Um, when I started my research uh, at the University of North Carolina, this was the primary uh, experiment that I was assigned to, uh, ionic thermocurrent or thermally stimulated depolarization. I want to call your attention to one dreadful instrument. Uh, that's a Trintrac um, optical controller. And you see, we, uh, this experiment through that device right there had to increase in temperature at a precisely linear rate, typically about three degrees Kelvin per, per second, uh, per, per minute rather. Um, and we controlled it with that device right there. And the, uh, uh, there was ink, a line, ink drawn line on that chart that described what the thermocouple voltage from the temperature sensor should be at each point in time and it had to be drawn very precisely and it would fade it would it would chip it would smear i didn't want to do anything like that um, i among my many skills among my few skills among uh, is is not being careful in drawing accurately a few to eight feet away there was this this is the DEC PDP-12 mini computer. It's called a mini computer because it's only the size of two refrigerators. Uh, it was sitting mostly idle. Uh, the department had bought it with a $48,000 grant. Uh, this, this is the University of North Carolina Physics Department. Um, about a year before to be used by the whole department. It was on wheels and so the idea, it would be rolled from lab to lab to take data, um, run experiments, and somehow it would all be shared. Um, a postdoc had been hired to, to get trained at the Digital Equipment Cor Corporation and train everyone else. And uh, he has succeeded in destroying all interest in the use of this computer by the time I began my research. Uh, whenever anyone wanted to use it, he said, fine, first you need to learn machine language, and he would hand them a book. Well, anybody that's programmed machine language knows that's not something you teach yourself. So, and, uh, but he handed me the book, and fortunately, I had taken a course in IBM 360 machine language. You learn one machine language, um, they're all pretty much the same, just like high-level languages. And so I was able to pass his test. And then he gave me the other book with Focal, which is a lot like basic, really easy to use. And so I suddenly had... In my sole possession, you know, he went off to uh, take another job. In my sole possession, I had a personal computer worth $48,000 that no one else wanted to use. And I found I could tap into the beam controlling the display. It wasn't a raster scan like TV sets. The beam would be, would it draw the picture with uh, one, one uh, voltage steering the beam left and right and the other up and down. And so by plotting a point, <laughs> a series of points on the screen, I could sweep the voltage and I didn't need to use that box. So I got really addicted to the notion of having a dedicated computer. I love my dedicated computer, but I finished my degree, headed off to the Naval Research Lab in Washington. Um, oh, one more thing before I leave. Uh, also, while I was in grad school, I taught the electronics lab and found that I really loved teaching the electronics lab. Um, I love explaining things. Um, many of you have been afflicted with my excessive explanations. Um, I do enjoy explaining things. Um, my kids, when they were growing up, kept this cartoon um, uh, on the refrigerator, uh, expressing their opinion of what I, they thought of my explaining things. Eventually, Billy came to dread his father's lectures over all, all other forms of punishment. <laughs> 
So went to the Naval Research Lab, and we did have a lab computer in my research group. Um, that's not my lab. That's actually the command deck of the Battlestar Galactica. Some of you may be old enough to remember that TV series. A couple of other scenes from there. That's actually a display of the Tektronix 4051. Uh, we were using it for more main mundane purposes, programming, but they would not let me keep it for my very own and wire it into my experiment. So I had to find another way. Um, and I was doing, among other experiments there, this very same thermally stimulated depolarization experiment. So I needed to get the, the strange, carefully programmed curve. And I wasn't going to do with the trend track machine. So um, electronic students, I hope you recognize that. Uh, that is uh, an op amp integrator. Now, if instead of having the AC source as shown, if you put a DC sig signal in, I just used a mercury battery, then you're integrating a constant, so you get a linearly increasing voltage. Okay, linearly increasing voltage, that's what I want the temperature to be. How do you translate that to the thermocouple? I had to have a personal computer. Digital computers were even that Tektronix 4051 and a few years later, that was still $20,000. So I built an analog computer. <laughs> Those chips on there are, are analog multipliers. The output voltage is proportional to the product of the two input voltages. And so you wire them together right, and I built a seventh degree polynomial. <laughs> so um, I use a seventh degree polynomial to, uh, to approximate the shape of this voltage versus temperature curve for thermocouples. And it worked, it worked beautifully. And I still had a dedicated personal computer but this was it. it would, the only way you could reprogram it was, in fact, to build a new circuit. So um, I, I uh, always wanted to end up at a university, not just any university, but Wake Forest University. Um, one thing I'd heard about that was student faculty engagement, the way it wasn't happening anywhere else at the undergraduate level. And um, so I applied for a job at Wake Forest uh, in 78. They turned me down, I stayed at the NRL. The next year, they were kind enough to take me. So uh, Jack Williams was the, the chair of the department. He's the one who hired me. And when I got here, he said, we've got a $45,000 grant for a lab mini computer. You remember lab, you know, mini computers, the refrigerator sized computers. They needed, had a grant for a new one. And so I, he said, I understand you've used computers. You know something about computers. How about uh, leading the effort? I said, well, I don't think we need $45,000. I think we can get by with a $20,000 computer, but I've also heard about these things called microcomputers, things even smaller than mini computers, things that would actually fit on a desktop. And so maybe, maybe with uh, the um, $25,000 we have left uh, after getting a Tektronix 4051, which after all is powerful enough to uh, to, to um, power the, uh, the Battlestar Galactica, should be able to meet, your, meet our lab needs. And uh, let's, let's see what we can do with microcomputers. I don't, I don't know how good they are. I've never seen one. I've never touched, touched one. But let's go to Greensboro. Greensboro had a microcomputer store. It was named the Corner Computer Store. Now go back in time to 1979. 1979, you know, up until that time, there were no computer stores, much less corner computer stores. If you wanted to buy a computer like those, the Tektronix 4051 or that PDP-12, vendors would come out to make pitches. You would have requests for proposals. Um, uh, there, there'd be a lot of discussion about this and bidding, and eventually a truck would uh, end up on your loading dock and they'll wheel, wheel in your computer, and this would be the first time you saw it. So the idea of going to a store and actually seeing computers on a countertop was a strange exper experience. Uh, but there it was. We walked into this place. It was close to UNCG, and there were these computers, these Commodore computers sitting on countertops. Well. Um, looked at that, and there was one thing I liked in particular about the Commodore computers, um, in contrast with the Apple that also existed at the time. Um, in common with the Tektronix 4051, it communicated with its peripherals, printers, disk drives, whatever, with the IEEE 48 bus, also the general purpose interface bus. See that big connector, that cable. Uh, there was a standard scientific 
uh, cable that you could connect computers to instruments. So you could connect that up to instruments like this. And so it, they connected to exactly the same things. And so with this, we could connect this directly to um, multimeters, um, voltage sources, current sources, whatever we needed to do our experiments. And so this seemed very promising. Plus, they had an, a, two, a three for the price of two deal. So we walked out of there with three of these things, brought it back to the apartment. And um, I got one on my desk, Jack got one. I think Howard Shields may have gotten the third and um, started playing with this thing. And so the next day I go into uh, Jack's office and I say, we don't need the $20,000 Tektronix 4051. This will do everything we could possibly want to do. It's amazing, it's powerful, it's a, it's, it is an honest to goodness computer. In fact, if you look back at the specs at the time, it's got just as, as good a specs as that Tektronix 4051 for everything except graphics. Everything else was, it was uh, just as powerful. So Jack says to me, can you teach a course on these? <laughs> this is my second week on the job. Young assistant professor, second week on the job. There's only one question, when, only one answer when your boss asks you that question, of course. Of course I can. We call it Physics 130, Introduction to Microcomputers. And so uh, with that, we went back to the corner computer store and bought nine more for a total of 12. Now bear in mind, two weeks earlier, when I arrived at Wake Forest, the campus had two computers. <laughs> um, now campus has 14, 12 had come, of which had come in the back of my car. I've only used them for a for you one for a day or so, but you know life is good. Things are going well, um, except I don't know anything about how to teach a course in them. So the next weekend, my wife Carolyn and I um, we went to every microcomputer store in the state. There were four of them: um, uh, Charlotte, Durham, Raleigh. We, we 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 hit those three cities. Bought every book related to the Commodore 64 and 6502 microprocessors that we could possibly find, and I brought them back and tried to learn enough about these to teach a course that started in January. And it was a race. It was a race. We found that this is wonderful for um, for teaching a physics class. We wanted not just programming. We wanted to be able to wire stuff to them. And if you look right back there, those pins connect directly to the memory bus of the computer. And so one of the things I learned by read, re reading these various books, and a lot of them were Xerox held together with staples and, um, and, and push pins. It was amazing. Uh, but, but I finished learning how to do the last lab the day before I needed to teach them the last lab. And we pulled it off. And you notice how the whole thing swings up like the hood of a car? Um, so imagine in our lab, the students were all there with a breadboard to the right, jumper cables going in there and, uh, and tying into those pins and, and, and having lots of fun. So we taught this course, no prerequisites. People would come in, come in here and we would uh, learn to program computers, learn to interface computers. Um, it was a wild time. We had these things all, the, all over the apartment. They were, um, oh, what do we call this room that we put uh, our, our computers in? It's a physics department. We're putting our hands on things. We're hooking up wires. It's a lab, a computer lab. We didn't know what else to call it. <laughs> so we had it controlling our experiments, analyzing our data. We even were doing scientific word processing. We had programmed little funky additions to, um, to paperclip our word processors. So an italics A printed out as alpha and italics B was beta. We had a little strip of paper across our keyboards. It, 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 it was so much fun. Um, so let's look back at that first year. So um, uh, yes, I was teaching the, the microcomputer course in January. Uh, I also taught a fall uh, one credit hour electronics lab in our two semester college physics class. That was the algebra based. Uh, we, we don't have that one anymore. Um, we'd roll that into 113, 114 um, at some point. But I needed to teach this. I needed to know how to teach. I had never uh, taught except the lab and Jack Williams came down to Salem 21 uh, where I was teaching my class three afternoons a week 
and uh, taught me how to teach. He showed me demos. He told me how he explained things. But I, there was important lessons. One of the things most important, and if you know Jack, you can understand why this is true. If you are excited, your students will be excited. The converse is certainly true. If, if, if you're not excited, they won't be. But, you know, physics is exciting. Uh, show that passion. Let your students know why you're so happy to be there. Um, look at your students' eyes. That's a powerful lesson that um, many people interviewing for faculty jobs haven't quite figured out. Uh, if you look at your student size, you know if they understand. You also know if they're raising their hand. <laughs> um, so that's very important. But the most important lesson that I learned from him is that teaching well is important at Wake Forest. Uh, he made it very clear to me that if I was going to be successful at Wake Forest, then I would teach well. Now, with his mentoring and and with uh, lots of advice from my wife, who was a trained educator, um, I, I figured out how to teach. I, le I learned a lot about teaching. And um, it's teaching is not obvious. It, 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 I, I wish it were. Um, and without that help, I would just be doing to my students what is done to me in the same way and probably not quite as well. So I'm so grateful to both Jack and to um, – to Carolyn for their mentoring me, especially in that very first year. Oh, it paid off. Um, I um, one of the one of the goals Jack laid out was to win the Excellence in Teaching Award. I did. There was a six hundred dollar cash award. There is my teaching award right back there. I had a home computer in something like let's see, look, judging from uh, Mark's uh, size there, this must have been. A, a winter of um, 82, 83. Okay, so um, life was good. Uh, I'm settling in, I'm figuring out how to teach. Um, my research was taking off. Um, and so, so, so life was good, enjoying myself. 1990 comes. Sheila Tobias, who's trained um, as a political scientist, as I recall, um, was contracted by the research corporation to do a study of first year physics classes. There, there were a number of observations coming out, um, some stats coming out that troubled the research corporation. One, fewer than a third of scientists and engineers named teachers as significant in their decision to do science. And even fewer claim to have paid any attention to the prestige of science or to its potential pay, potential for pay or promotion. School didn't seem to matter much to scientists and engineers. And, you know, that's, I did not find that particularly surprising. Um, oh, she, she, uh, I heard her talk at one of the American Physical Society meetings and she, um, said, if you ask most professionals, who was that teacher that turned you on to the field, that got you excited, decided, that made you decide to go into this? Their eyes light up. They tell you this wonderful story about Professor so-and-so. But if you ask a physicist, typically their face goes blank. And in, in fact, um, it wasn't my teachers. I'm grateful for my teachers. They, they taught well, but you know, um, that wasn't who turned me on to physics. Um, and in fact, I don't remember learning a lot in my physics classes. I took good notes, but I, I kind of had to choose between writing down what the professor was saying and understanding what the professor was saying. I chose the former, then I would figure out what it all meant back in my room. All right. Another observation of the, those who switch out, who came in expecting to major in science or engineering, a little less than a third did so because it was too hard. The biggest group found other fields more interesting. For me, it's hard to imagine. 26% uh, believed they would have had better job prospects elsewhere. This was, you know, 1990. Thing, I don't think anybody would think that now. Um, but this, this was an observation uh, made at the time. There has to be room in science for people who did not ask for a chemistry set at age of five like so many of us did. Um, so it's, that's what they were looking. So they asked Sheila Tobias to try to figure out what's going wrong. It's the way she did it, she hired 
a group of um, humanities graduates, folks with humanities degrees, uh, mostly graduate students in the humanities. Um, some, uh, one was a college professor and hired them to take calculus-based first-year physics and report on their findings. And so, so she had focus groups, she um, had them keep logs, that sort of thing. And the, and the findings were interesting. Of these people she hired, these huma bright humanities uh, graduates she hired, almost without exception, they liked physics and they did very well in their classes. Okay, that sounds good. Almost without exception, they hated their physics classes. That is, they loved studying the book, they loved doing the problems, they did well the problems, but they described hating being in their classes. The classes at this university where they were, um, were all very lecture-based, and this was such a striking contrast to their very interactive, lively, discussion-oriented seminars in their various humanities majors. And so this did not hold up well uh, in their perceptions of what it's like to be in class. It did not meet their expectations for what it was like to be in class. So um, it's, uh, that, that, that was quite an interesting conclusion. But uh, basically, what Sheila Tobias concluded from this study and some other work she did is that people who become physicists do so in spite of their college classes, not because of their college classes. Where in so, in so many fields, the, that, that one possibly required liberal arts requirement is what turned them on to it. Now, um, I don't think, well, I'm confident that was not really the case at Wake Forest. Um, you know, the, the, I told you the efforts that Jack Williams made to be sure I taught well. And that was the culture of the physics department. Uh, it shows up in this way. Those are five excellence in teaching award winners from this department. Uh, it's, it's not unusual for faculty in this department to, to win the excellence in teaching award. It is unusual for them not to be outstanding teachers because we care about it, we're committed to it, we help each other, we pass on tips. We love engaging with our students. We, we bring them into our labs. Um, this, this is the Wake Forest physics culture. And one uh, statistic that I, will, I, I, that I recall from my memory at the time when reading this book, I, I recognized that m at Wake Forest, if they were talking about people coming in, planning to major in science, and then attrition. They switched somewhere else. In Wake Forest, we graduated more physics majors than um, prospective physics majors entered four years before. That is, we were converting people to physics. Uh, they, they came, they took our first year class, and they fell in love. So I don't think this book, can, this book did not really connect with me all that much. It did co connect to a little greater extent with, some, with other places in the field. Okay, so I, I, I settled back. I'm not gonna worry about that book. Two years later, this paper comes out. Force Concept Inventory. It's basically a multiple choice twist, t test on physics concepts. Um, they, are, uh, they don't require much in the way of computation, very uh, simple problems, but getting at the concepts pre-test, post-test, and what they found was that even students doing very well in our classes, this is in first year, um, first semester, in fact, general physics, uh, they, were, they often did not understand, most often did not understand the concept upon which these problems were based. They might be able to work an inclined, pardon me, an inclined plane problem, but they didn't really understand the, the principles of Newton's second law. They might be able to work uh, problems using Newton's third law without really understanding Newton's third law. This is what they claimed. And every physicist I know who read that paper said, well, maybe their students, not my students, until I gave my students the force concept inventory. My, um, yes, they were get, getting hooked, they were engaged, uh, in the classes, they enjoy the classes, 
they learned they did well and they went on to be physics majors and somewhere along the way they did learn these concepts but they weren't learning it in my first year class um, and not very many first year classes, as a matter of fact. So these two works, two years apart, really shook up the field of physics education. For the first time, a, a lot of us really began to think about whether there was a better way to teach, whether we were teaching as effectively as we thought we were. That triggered a revolution in physics education. And something that you will find is that there is that physics education um, has a presence in the discipline of physics, unlike almost any other academic discipline. Um, it is uh, a big field and is paid attention to. Um, and, and results started coming out as people started trying to find new ways of, of teaching. Here is an analysis of what turns out to be absolutely critical in learning first year physics. Interactive engagement. Uh, the Burgundy bar graphs are uh, traditional lecture courses. The green bars are interactive engagement. That is in class, are you listening and taking notes or are you answering questions, solving problems, doing something other than just being the recipient of content? This is uh, a normalized score on the force concept inventory I talked about on the previous slide. Zero mean, and these are class averages. Zero means nobody, that on average, nobody learned anything. One means that everyone got the, uh, every answer right on the final test. And so in between is where real um, classes fell. Notice that no traditional class on average, broke 0.3. Um, and, the, and the most uh, commonly, commonly occurring value was 0.24. For the interactive engagement classes, 85% of those classes were more than 0.3. And 0.6 was the most commonly occurring value. Where, where do you want your students? Do you want them on the, to be on the green curve or the burgundy curve? That was a very important message. We need to somehow get in into our classes and in interactive engagement. Our students shouldn't just be listening to us, they need to apply themselves, not watch us apply, but apply themselves the concepts to solving some kind of problem. The um, American Association of Physics Teachers took, uh, took this uh, to heart and started offering faculty workshops on different techniques to uh, do this. As I recall, Bill Kerr and Danny Kim Shapiro the, were the first from our department to go there. They went, they came back, and they shared everything they learned with us. It really changed the way we taught um, a lot. The one that connected most with my own teaching was peer instruction, um, also called concept tests, also called clicker questions. Here's an example. A ship carries a cargo of steel girders in a lock of the Panama Canal. The crew mutinies and throws the cargo overboard into the canal. Okay, steel cargo thrown in the water. Does the water level in the lock rise, fall, or stay the same? So that's a typical clicker question. And the way it works, you um, have, uh, you, you show the questions, you just have 30, uh, 60 seconds to think about it. They answer with cards or clickers. Um, then they discuss it with their buddies uh, sitting next to them for another 60 seconds. They answer again, they discuss as a class. Sounds pretty mundane. Sounds like it wouldn't make much difference. It does. It, it makes a huge difference on those kinds of scores we saw earlier. Um, that and uh, other techniques, just-in-time teaching. And by the way, Danny is uh, acknowledged on the back uh, of just-in-time teaching to this. That was a, really an early form of flip classes. Um, it, it's, and it, it makes a difference. We find that it does make a difference. Uh, this, little, this is an experiment that came out of MIT. Um, is brain, they wired up a bunch of um, students, and this is a single MIT student, apparently a representative one, brainwave 24 hours a day a week, and it's color-coded by different activities. So um, lab, lots of activity, studying, lots of brain activity, exam, 
more studying. Even sleeping, there is some brain activity. Watching TV, not so much. There's no surprises there. But what was discouraging? Class time. Look at that. <laughs> brain dead. Class time. Can everybody see my cursor? Okay. <laughs> um, class time. You, you know, if it's fortunate they were only recording this data rather than being uh, monitored real time, uh, they would have probably brought in a crash cart thinking the student had died when they went to class. <laughs> so what do we learn about this? Well, uh, one thing I learned is there's a magic seven minutes after I do one of these peer instruction questions. Uh, the students thought they knew Newton's third law, but here was a simple question and they got it wrong. Now they're really paying attention. Uh, they, they hate them if, if we give one or fewer per class but they actually like them if we give two or more uh, per class. One interesting discovery is that students participate more even outside of these peer instruction activities if I'm doing at least two of these. My theory is it's an e e easy on-ramp to class participation. Essentially, um, you know, you, there's a, there's a, they, so they're thinking about a physics question in class and they speak about, they articulate an idea about it to their two buddies in round one. And then they think about it another 30 seconds. And afterwards, we're trying to discuss it in class. I'll say, well, who'll speak up for, you know, who had answer B? Would anyone speak up for it? Well, they've already run the, their answer by their two buddies. So if it was a really stupid answer. They would, their buddies would have told them. So they don't mind speaking up. And from there, it's only a small step forward to speak up spontaneously in class. And I found that my class was just so much more lively, even outside of these activities. And um, so the very first semester that I committed to always giving at least two of these every class had the biggest jump in my student end of course evaluations I've ever had in my career. That was cool. Uh, let me share a free response. This was my favorite class because it was the most interactive class I've had at Wake Forest. This was a class of 102. <laughs> Peer instruction works. Peer instruction works. I never got a comment like that before. Okay, are students lazy? Um, students, you, you may or may not have heard faculty pose, actually not usually questions, students are lazy. I don't think so, but I have made some interesting observations. Um, example, Physics 230 Electronics. I was always disappointed in the homework because my, the, my homework assignments were always designing a circuit that does such and such. I would get the assignment. It would be mostly correct, not, not perfect. It wouldn't work. I'd, give, I'd put an 87 on there. The student was satisfied. But nowhere in this process was there a circuit that works. And aside from electronics courses, there's very little use for designing circuits that don't work. So anyway, I was frustrated. But then I discovered simulation software. Uh, this was Circuit Maker. Uh, nowadays, our electronics class uses a web-based simulator. But this allows you, look over here on the right, you can lay out, um, a circuit. You, 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 you drag down a resistor and a capacitor and a transistor, hook them all together. And you can come in with a virtual oscilloscope and put one probe here and another probe there and get exactly the graph that a real oscilloscope would show you. This thing is amazingly accurate simulation. Uh, it even shows device limits, that kind of thing. So in st I changed the way I graded homework. I, own, I gave binary homework grades. Everything was 100 or zero. If the circuits works, they get 100. If it doesn't work, why are you turning it into me? I ask you for a gain of 200 amplifier. This is not a gain of 200 amplifier. Go give me a gain, gain of 200 amplifier. So before that, I realized my homework was not really teaching the students anything. It was merely documenting what they knew and didn't know. And now with this, at the moment they would have turned in their homework, learning begins. At the moment they would have turned in that mostly correct but not working circuit, now they see with the simulation, with the simulation that this doesn't work. And so they start trying to figure out why not. They go back to their text, they, they can do troubleshooting, measuring different points. There's a bias, what I thought it would be, is that's what this little, these two resistors are supposed to set the voltage here at a certain point. 
they would talk to their, to their classmates. They'd come talk to me in my office. Learning begins. And they learn so much more. I remember an afternoon in an electronics lab, the first semester we deployed this, my TA, Alan Tackett, came over to me and says, what's going on? I said, what do you mean? He says, we're talking. Yes. We've never had time to talk in here before. We've always been the bottleneck in lab, working our way around 180 degrees apart. And now they're just busily building their circuits, troubleshooting it. They don't need us. <laughs> Um, it was it was dramatic. Uh, and so one of the things I learned is that, first of all, students want to master concepts. They, they enjoyed electronics far more after I put that in there. But they are prone to an overly optimistic assessment of how well they have mastered the material. They didn't know they were turning in a non-working circuit. And with prompt feedback, at the time when it's most helpful, while they're working on their homework, that enables them to realize there's more here. And it mot motivates them to master the materials, master the concepts. So it's really important to, uh, to get that prompt feedback. WebAssign, same thing. Uh, the WebAssign is online um, physics homework. And, and you submit your, each student gets a slightly different version of every problem. You submit your answer and it says, it says right or wrong. Well, um, we, we thought this was a terrible idea. Physics problems are hard. Most of the time you miss it. On, and, um, and so if we do it, don't give partial credit, the student homework grades are probably going to average around 20 and the whole system breaks down. Bob Beekner uh, was over telling us about this one at a, at a colloquium one time. And he said, uh, well, be honest with me. Your, 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 your homework's being graded fast by uh, upper level undergrads or grad students. And so they can take a quick look. If, it, if the answer is right, they give them a 10. If there's anything relevant, they get a six. If it's somewhere in between, they get an eight. Well, yeah. It says, well, your students at Wake Forest are bright and hardworking. Uh, they realize they get 80% credit for 10% of the work. You are training them to get eight out of 10 assignments and not solving physics problems. I said, but how, we can't have 20 homework grades of 20. He said, give them seven chances. And that's what we do. So once again, prompt feedback. Now they're learning a lot more when we, since we switched to WebAssign. And I came to realize that we shouldn't be thinking about teaching. We should thinking, be thinking about learning. It's not about what we do. It's what the students learn. And everything we try, everything we structure about our course should be in that context. I mean, think about how most workplaces have changed um, in, in just the last 25 years, the last 50 years. Now think about a typical classroom. And aside from having cheaper desks, instead of the beautiful varnished solid wood, rows of seats pointing toward the front. Well, forget 150 years ago. Let's go back 5,000 years. Uh, this is the oldest known classroom rows of seats facing forward. And why has it been around for 5,000 years? It's the most efficient means ever devised to transfer the professor's notes to the student's notes and skeptics say without passing through the brain of either. But, you know, that's his content delivery. Gutenberg invented the printing press and made books affordable. That should have begun to change our thinking, but we also have our own custom content Tim Berners-Lee invented the web. The web made the printing press affordable. Each of us can supply a content, whether it's text or videos or images, so easily now. We should not be wasting the time we are together on content delivery. My grad student, Tommy Law, when, he, when we discovered the web in December 94, the world has changed and most people do not know it yet. Um, example, I, could, I couldn't teach Lynn, um, a related example. I couldn't teach ray tracing to my students. I do, do my best to try to explain it in different ways. They would always do horribly on my examples. They would bend the rays to put the image um, where they thought it would. I built this animated uh, GIF and uh, a set of these for different configurations. Next, next time I gave a test, they scored over 90% on average on my ray tracing problems. 
Um, another challenge, I entered a class having explained, spent the last 25 minutes explaining a difficult concept, looked out, all the eyes were glazed. And um, what was I going to do? Um, I, I, I hated to go over it again in the next class. But I spent the next four hours turning the last 25 minutes in class into a six-minute lecture, and the students understood. Next, I get to class next day. Do I should I go over this more? No. The lecture was great. Video was great. Thank you. It's another lesson learned. Pause and rewind are powerful. Students being able to look at our lectures at their own pace sometimes results in better outcomes than live lecture. Jackie Fetro and I were over at Elizabeth's Pizza having lunch, and we thought about this. We thought about the need to free up class time to do more interactive engagement activities. We also thought about how hard it is to make videos. So we came back after lunch and we said, who wants to help make videos? All 14 faculty members pitched in. We signed up for the top 60 topics in first year physics, and we all made lecture videos. And, and um, so they were all there for us to use. They were still there a few years later. I'll come back to that. Um, but it's one more possibility, one more way for students to learn, and it'll come back to a very important role they play in just a moment. That was 2006, 2007 comes, we get a new provost. Two weeks later, she asked me to be associate provost. Nine months later, I end up in information systems and I'm gone for a while. Okay, this is all weird times, but um, I did uh, accomplish some things in education wise. We did uh, deploy Google. Google Docs is the most powerful tool for collaboration ever. Qualtrics uh, is very useful for folks in the social sciences. WebEx, whoa. This week's we're so glad that we have things like WebEx and Zoom and we, and we moved our culture toward using these tools along the way. But I also had a tall, uh, oh, pardon me, let me note that I learned a lot about how people work together and how to support people working together. That's not irrelevant to the classroom. I had a lot of time to think, what will I do for, differently when I come back? I knew I was coming back. First, don't waste any time that we're together doing things that can be done almost as well when we're not. And maybe some things can be done better when we're not, not together, like lecture, like content. Interactive engagement, let's jump in the deep end. How, how much interactive engagement can I have in a class? All. And maximize prompt feedback, we talked about that. Drive, let me take a moment. Um, heard this guy talk at Educause while I was CIO. He related some interesting research. Rewards diminish performance on cognitive tasks. If somebody is putting together widgets, give them a bonus, they'll put together more. Double the bonus, put together more still. If they're solving physics problems, if you, if you offer bonuses for being able to solve them faster, their performance goes down. Double the bonus, the performance goes down still more. Very counterintuitive. Also, rewards destroy joy in cognitive tasks. Okay, think about that. And grades are rewards. So pieces of the puzzle. We've got these different things we've learned along the way about what makes for effective learning. And yes, let's think about learning and not teaching. And so that stored me toward uh, flip classes. I'm not going to take time to read this except for the words are interactive and apply concepts and engage creatively in class. That's what physics research has been telling us since the 1990s we should be focusing on. And so I came back and flipped my class. I tried different types of lecture videos. Um, some of them are, 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 it looks like they all work. Short stories, students don't care. They're, they're very forgiving. Um, they're just glad to have your lecture available when they want it. So I flipped it. So before class, uh, they watch a video, then work some easy online problems in WebAssign. They come to class, they're breaking up into small groups, we're alternating between those peer instruction concept tests, small group problem solving on these whiteboards. After class, more web assigned problems, this time harder like they had in class. Repeat, that's, that's our whole flip class. Very simple, um, no genius in this, just do that over and over again, but one thing very special. Um, 
about this. And by the way, I found it works so well that I, I find I can let students discover on their own some things that I normally would have taught them. And so those of you who have had physics know what this is all about. This was the breakthrough of Maxwell's equations. My students figure out Maxwell's equations on their own. Because, because somehow it just works. I th lots of physics classes have been flipped around the world, around the country. The one thing we do differently, nothing is graded. If you come back to what Dan Pink was talking about with rewards, diminishing performance, and, and destroying joy, this is the one chance we have when we're together in class to expect students to work hard problems without the reward or pressure of grades. They can just come in and have fun and, in, and it works. I didn't know if students would like it or not, but they do, they work really hard and they seem to enjoy it a lot more than my students did before. They think they learn more. They think that other physics faculty should adopt the approach. Do they learn more? I want to thank Jack for the data in this. He alternated teaching flipped and traditional. And what you see there is that, in fact, if you use the normal supply score, his students on the FCI, on average, learned twice as much as in his traditional classes. Same teachers, same text. And in, by the way, he's a very good traditional teacher when he does it that way. He uses best practices. Something I like about this a lot is the lines are parallel. So it works just as well for the best students and the weakest students. So um, quick summary. I'm, this went longer than I had hoped. It's been a wild ride for 41 years. Progress in technology over the time has been equaled by and to a significant extent has been enabled by progress in pedagogy. Probably has enabled progress in pedagogy. Much of what happens in this, my classroom requires no technology beyond the whiteboards, but it wouldn't happen without the technology for structuring what happens outside of class. The key difference from other flipped classes and what we do here, and there's several hours of the department that are doing, is that nothing that happens in class affects grades. Where else will students spend hours working on hard physics problems ungraded? We know that rewards diminish performance and diminish the joy on learning. So this ungraded approach frees students to fall in love. So why not? Why not? One quick word of thanks to all the people who have uh, made it possible for me to grow and learn and, and have fun along the way. The department, the folks in information systems, especially Nancy Crouch, the instructional technology group, my 10 bosses, and especially word for my family that's been patient and tolerant and supportive all these years. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Rick. Woo Thank you. It was great. It was really great. Happy birthday, Rick. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Thank you very much. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> Gretchen, wow. <laughs> Hello. Right. Hey. hey, Rick, I have a question. Yes. So I see Steven standing there in that picture that you left up on the screen. Mm -hmm. I'm curious how your uh, um, evolution of teaching has affected your interaction with uh, the grad student assistants that you have within your courses. Well, that's been fun. Uh, so the, 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 the graduate students and I have pretty much exactly the same role. When they're doing these hard physics problems, we just rotate, floating from group to group, uh, looking to see if they're stuck or going down the wrong path. And then they, um, and if they are, we come over and ask leading questions and be sure they get back on track. Uh, that's, uh, that's all we have to do. And if, by doing that, nobody falls far behind. All the groups finished at almost the same time. And, the, and so, so I've been blessed with wonderful grad students and, and they, they've been played a critical role in uh, make, have, making this work. And they do chime in. We do have some snippets of lecture. They chime in and with better explanations to me quite often. Uh, Rick, I have a question. Um, in the um, flipped classroom, um, do you you also integrated the labs, right, or at least partially? 
Uh, to some extent. So to some yeah. extent, it, it, I mean, uh, it, we haven't changed that a lot. Mostly we go across the hall and do the same labs. Uh, yeah. I did in 113, I have substituted some computational labs for the uh, physical labs. Okay, so it's not an integral part of the flip classroom itself. It's no, that's something I would like to do more of, but uh, as of yet, uh, no, no, that's not true. Okay. I have a question, Rick. Mm -hmm. Everywhere, not only Wake Forest, but other universities are putting all this effort into the first year physics course. Is anyone anywhere doing anything in upper level courses? Fred, you think once. Fred, you want to take this one? Fred Salisbury is, <laughs> and and I also think about uh, years ago before I ever did it. Paul Anderson essentially flipped his electricity and magnetism class. I can I can throw in one example. I know the folks at Kansas State have done a lot of work with the quantum mechanics class uh, in the undergraduate uh, upper level undergraduate. Well, it sounds like everybody's done asking questions. I think we should sing a happy birthday song through the internet. There's, 70, there's 71 of us. That's kind of a lot of people. So I don't know if this has ever been done before in this format, but let's sing a, a couple of bars of happy birthday. Everyone can happy, happy birthday, birthday to, to you. you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, 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 birthday to you. Wow, that was great. You know, there's Thank you so much. It's hard, but we did it. Woo! <laughs> yeah, I think you've been the first one to actually attend a colloquium from your car. <laughs> <laughs> I will say, I listened to most of it inside the house, but it was noisy inside the house. So when I wanted to ask a question, I came out to my car. Everybody in my family listened too. It was really great. Good, especially the stuff on the computers. My kids didn't know that stuff. That was great. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Rick. Matthews. I actually have a quick question, if you don't mind. Sure. So this is I have a broadly philosophical question, but mm -hmm. uh, some friends and I were talking about. Do you think it'll ever be the case that you'll be able to completely make a classroom experience virtual, like deliver lectures online, have help occur online, or do you think there's uh, an aspect of being physically in a class that is unusually helpful to students? I, I do. Uh, well, qualify that. Um, I, I, being in a live class, I think, has considerable value. I think collaboration has a lot of value. Uh, just working on problems together. You know, we all, uh, even in traditional lecture classes, strongly recommend our students form study groups and do their homework problems together because we know it works. It works for us. Um, you know, I think one of the differences between the people who enjoy first year physics and the ones who don't is whether or not they formed a good study group. It's hard to solve physics problems on your own. And, the, you know, there is this myth of the scientists working alone in the lab, making the major breakthroughs. And we all know that that's just the opposite. Uh, scientists are very collaborative and, and we, we discover each other's wrong ideas. This is also more broadly great, great training for the profession. Um, it's, it's teamwork is important in so many careers. Physicists, I think, uh, physics trains you for teamwork better than most any other major because my man got, got the, we, we, we listen. Uh, we, um, we, we are, uh, we are trained to listen to each other, uh, because we want to get the right answer and there is a right answer. And so we're not just trying to have our answer win. We want the right answer to win. And, and I've seen the collaboration. Oftentimes students explain better to each other than I can. The other piece that's very useful here is for my TAs and me to uh, spot when they're going down the wrong alley and just focus them. And so it's usually where that equation come from. Does that really apply to this situation? And that speeds up the class considerably. Uh, they, you know, they wouldn't be able to work as, as I first started laying it out, I didn't know what the flip class would work because I wanted more problems done than they would be able to do in homework. But they work it much faster because they don't stay, stay stuck on a blind alley very long. And I think that takes a human being, uh, experienced human, uh, experienced physicist looking over their shoulder and just taking 
a few seconds to get him back on track. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hey, Rick, this is Gretchen. Hi, Gretchen. One of your fellows. And um, Neelam and Darcy and John and I are on this call. Oh, and cool. I thought it was really hey, great. And this is somewhat of a loaded question, but we were just curious if you think, you know, the COVID-19 situation, moving everything online, you know, at Wake and other institutions is going to in any way fundamentally change learning delivery in higher ed or will it just kind of all go you know back to normal whatever that looks like when this is all done well there's there's tremendous opportunity and tremendous risk because um first of all we're suddenly in over the space of two weeks we've had thousands upon thousands of teachers add more tools to their toolbox that they can use to be able to teach more effectively in the future. And so that's, the, so that's the good news. The bad news is that it's a lot easier to teach online, teach poorly online. Um, it's, it's harder to teach online well than in a traditional environment. We've all had a lot of experience as students in traditional classes. Most of us have had close to zero experience in online classes. And so there are going to be some train wrecks this week, next week, and um, that's going to sour a lot of students and teachers on online education. Um, one analogy that, lips, that, flips, uh, that, that pops to mind, I was asking my students in my flipped class, what do we want to name this? Did, you know, what, what is the best? We want to attract more students into this section. And something they all said is don't call it a flipped class. They said, we, we, we love this, this format, but high school students, when they hear flipped, they think of that one poorly done flipped class where it was a way for the teacher to read the newspaper while they work problems by themselves. <laughs> um, I'm, I worry that for a lot of online experiences, is this going to be that. Here at Wake Forest, we're fortunate that we have a lot more support resources in the Center for Advanced Teaching and in Information Systems an academic technology and instructional technology group. Um, there is a lot of help for faculty that um, most places don't have and, and they have existing relationships with the faculty. And so I, I think we'll have fewer, less crashing and burning. Now we have set the expectations. We, we've tried to help people say, you're not going to offer the, the ultimate online class this semester. That takes months of development. You've got, you've got a week and a half. Um, and so it's not going to be the perfect experience, but I do like the idea. We've got another tool, actually several tools, video conferencing, Jamboard, uh, all kinds of tools we're learning, uh, you know, Canvas. So I think we're that um, a, there, a lot of people will move forward. Some people will get turned off. So it'll be interesting to see. Well, thanks so much, Rick. This was amazing. Thank you.